Good evening. I'm Robert Newman. I'm the president of the National Humanities Center. And before I introduce this evening's speaker, I want to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors for this evening's event, UNC Global Affairs and the Husband School of Journalism and Media. And I especially want to acknowledge the work of Katie Costanza, Emmy Grace, and everyone here at FedEx Global Education Center who have been incredibly gracious and enthusiastic hosts. I also want to personally thank Dean Raul Rice, Kyle York, and Leah Massey from the Hussman School for their helpfulness and their willingness to partner in bringing Jane Ferguson to the UNC campus. UNC has been an invaluable partner in the work of the National Humanities Center for 45 years, and they, along with our other institutional sp uh, sponsors and partners, and the GlaxoSmithKline Foundation are essential to the center's public activities, as well as our work on behalf of humanities scholarship and teaching. Now, several years ago, uh, in my previous position, when I was Dean of Humanities at the University of Utah, I had the occasion to invite the late Dr. Paul Farmer, a medical anthropologist at Harvard and the co-founder of Partners in Health, an organization that has had a monumental impact on the promotion of global health equity in poor and remote communities in Africa and elsewhere. I invited him to give the annual Tanner Lecture in Human Values. And during the Q&A that followed his wonderful lecture, one undergraduate student asked him for advice about choosing a meaningful career path. And I'll never forget his response. He said, first, you must discover what your questions are. Now, I interpreted him to, interpreted him to mean that to learn where your passions reside, passions that will inform your personal quest and the answers that you seek requires you first to frame the questions most resonant to, to you, uh, questions that will echo throughout your life. In her gripping memoir, No Ordinary Assignment, Jane Ferguson writes, what is the point of exposing war crimes and the appalling price of war if it's never going to stop it? Does my work make a difference? I still don't know fully know the answer, but I do know that maybe having an impact is something we cannot and should not look for. Maybe it's our Western mindset, our individualism that wants to witness and feel the influence we have on the world to see results. Maybe it's our ego. In all honesty, the only question I can answer is, did I do my part? Did I do my part? This is the question Jane Ferguson continually asks herself throughout her exhilarating, dangerous, and influential journey as an international war correspondent. It's a crucial question for her, as it ought to be for all journalists. Indeed, for every responsibly minded person confronted with the often overwhelming horrors of war zones, either experienced in on the ground observations of blood, treachery, and hopelessness, or more remotely in photographs and news reports that take us past the sensational and the superficial into more empathetic and transformative moments of kinship. Did I do my part? It's a question that assumes professional and personal honesty are intertwined. That living one's life morally includes dedication to the well-being of others in intimate connection with realizing one's own destiny. It means not looking away, not getting distracted, not ignoring the truth, even when doing so might constitute a more twisted and troubling path. It means following your heart as well as your head and doing what you know deep down inside is right for you and for those whose stories you will tell. It means bearing unflinching witness to both the horrific consequences of war and the erratic and uplifting moments of genuine, humane warmth that momentarily transcend these consequences. 
Jane Ferguson has done her part, reporting from the most dangerous places in war-torn Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other regions. She has ignored the soundbite and braved artillery fire, bombing, and imminent kidnapping to capture the stories of the people most impacted by these conflicts, the old, the little children, the poor, the bereft, and most often the girls and women whose well-being is directly imperiled by religious fanaticism and political marginalization. Along the way, she's been awarded a Peabody Award, two Alfred DuPont Columbia University Silver Batons, an Emmy, and the Overseas Press Club of, of America Peter Jennings Award, among other awards. She is a special correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, a contributor to The New Yorker, and a visiting professor of war reporting now at Princeton University. She grew up in County Armagh in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, an experience which, as she explained so vividly in her memoir, shaped her fascination with her life's work and her immense passion for it. In other words, Jane learned what her questions were, and since then has focused her prodigious energy and empathy on doing her part, on making a difference, a quest at which she continues to succeed admirable, admirably, contributing to our lasting enlightenment and gratitude. Please welcome Jane Ferguson. Well, um, just want to make sure everybody can hear me uh, right up at the back. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much to Robert and everybody at the National Humanities Center, uh, Jackie and Heidi as well, who have been taking such good care of me today. I'm really honored to be invited here to speak. Um, and it's just also, I must say, a huge honor to be speaking in a hall named after such a giant among uh, human rights activists. Uh, and and I, it, it's absolutely apt that I find myself here, um, but at the same time, massively intimidating to, to even speak to you in a place named after someone like Nelson Mandela. Jane, do you think Barack Obama will do a no-fly zone like in Libya? A young Syrian activist asked me in Homs City in January 2012. We were in a tiny living room in an apartment turned media center in the Syrian uprising. Outside, the neighborhood was surrounded by Bashar al-Assad's tanks, artillery guns, and snipers. I sat on the floor with several other activists and watched on a tiny TV set the news coverage of the UN Security Council debating its response to Assad's brutal crackdown on these young men and other protesters. They wore sweatsuits and pulled on cheap cigarettes. Young, hopeful faces convinced history and America was on their side. In the end, no help came for the Syrians. Seven years later, in 2019, in northeastern Syria, I watched as American armored vehicles drove down dusty roads away from the front, heading across the border to their bases in Iraq. The Kurdish fighters who had helped the US and its allies defeat ISIS there were now under attack by the Turkish army along their northern border. President Trump, after promising to stand and defend America's allies, had reneged on those promises and ordered US troops to leave, leaving the Kurds on the battlefield alone. Kurdish civilians stood at the side of the road and watched, dumbfounded, as the US flag fluttered from the back of mud-smeared mud -smeared special forces pickup trucks racing by. Almost two years after that, in 2021, I stood on a tiny road in the middle of the Gorband Valley, north of Kabul, as the roar of battle bounced off the rocky peaks. Afghan government soldiers had fallen back further down the road behind us, as these local Tajik militias tried to hold the line. Quote, Biden left in the middle of the road. America abandoned us, said a stony-faced militiaman, his chest wrapped in a green ammunition belt. Three events three different US presidents, but one unifying theme. 
a withdrawal of America from the world, a world often in chaos and looking for leadership and partnership. In the years since the disastrous invasion of Iraq and global war on terror, the US has overcorrected in its, in, in its engagement and leadership around the world to such an extent that myself and my colleagues are often asked, where is America? The days of US leadership in the world can seem like a distant memory. As America has retreated over the last decade and a half, it has abandoned a clear, coherent vision for its role in the world. As this nation has tried to move past the disastrous overreach of President George W. Bush, its identity crisis in the world is worse than ever. I know, you might be shocked to find someone who has dedicated their life to highlighting the horror of war and the personal catastrophe that conflict brings to individuals, families, and communities standing in front of you now, making the case for greater US involvement abroad. But if you are, that is likely because you too are now associating US involvement with death, war, crimes, and loss. And yet, this is exactly what the US retreat from global leadership has wrought. It is what my colleagues and I have been covering throughout our careers, from the Arab Spring protests to bloody civil wars. Human rights atrocities run amok, and dictatorships stand on necks. And where America has demurred, Russia has stepped in. The war in Iraq was a catastrophe, but the US response to that disaster, retreat from leadership of the liberal world order, has undermined the very values and freedoms America has tried to bring to the world for the latter half of its existence. Everything we abhorred about the abuses and loss of life in Iraq has compounded around the Middle East and beyond, in part due to US isolationism and not despite it. The ugly truth is, without leadership in the world advocating human rights and democratic freedoms, yes, sometimes backed by force, those who oppose those very freedoms step in Intervention does not have to mean bombs are dropped or countries are invaded. It very rarely does. America is the most powerful nation on earth and has an arsenal of diplomatic and economic tools at its disposal to help those who reach out for the very values the US is based on. What is critical is the willingness to use those tools to influence positive change and offer help to people demanding the same freedoms we all enjoy. The spreading state violence and human rights abuses across the Middle East and beyond have grown in rapid pace since I began reporting from there 15 years ago. I've seen what it does to people. The actions of cynical leaders when they decide America and the free world will not act when they force their will with horrific brutality on innocent civilians. I've spent years documenting its toll and it does alarm me to see how that rot has now reached the boundaries of Europe. America's isolationism of recent years has grown on both sides of the political divide. On the far right, populist leaders espouse a vision of America as an island that needs nothing from the world and need offer it nothing in return. These people believe the dictators of this world can be coddled, negotiated with, or somehow appeased. They are no threat to the US. On the extreme progressive left, intervention is seen as a form of domination, an affront to the sovereignty of nations, even if those nations are held hostage by mass murderers. If the US left completely alone, people would live in peace. This viewpoint sees the world as it wishes it to be, not as it is. Now we face a 2024 presidential election that threatens the military support of Ukraine, a sovereign democratic nation invaded by an expansionist dictatorship, Russia. Every value the entire liberal world order claims to hold dear is in serious danger of even more American capitulation. As journalist and author George Packer wrote recent, recently in The Atlantic, quote, this restraint is not a hard-won prudence in the face of tragic facts. It's a doctrinaire refusal by people living in the safety and comfort of the West to believe in liberal, in liberal values that
that depend on American support. The restrainers can't accept that politics leaves no one clean and that the most probable alternative to US hegemony is not international peace and justice, but worse hegemons. They can't face the reality that force never disappears from the world. It simply changes hands." Unquote. He is right. I have seen it. How did we get here? How did the world's leading superpower turn its gaze inward and retreat from its role as a global leader? On September 11, 2001, the post-Cold War complacency of the Western world was shattered. 19 extremists struck deep at the heart of this country, hitting its government and commercial capitals while killing thousands of innocents and shaking to its core the belief that history was over. Yet the theorists and practitioners of global affairs had not yet adjusted to the world of non-state actors and asymmetrical threats. And as a result, they viewed this latest attack through the same lens of a gargantuan battle between civilizations. The only thing that had changed in their view was that the replacement of communism was with Islamic extremism. The American response met the moment with the sweeping approach required of a titanic generational struggle. And George W. Bush chose not to stop at Afghanistan, but to continue on to Iraq and threaten additional nations that he saw as complicit. He and the neocons believed they were making the world a better place. They thought they were bringing democratic values to the Arab world. This from his second inaugural address. Quote, we are led by events and common sense to one conclusion. The survival of liberty in our land increasingly depends on the success of liberty in other lands. The best hope for peace in our world is the expansion of freedom in all the world. This glowing vision, however, met with hard reality as the US effort in Iraq went from bad to worse. The use of force for regime change has been well documented as disastrous. The cost of American overreach was felt not just by its own citizens and warfighters, but by millions of civilians in Iraq and its neighboring countries. US foreign policy had failed. In the years after, the time for a new vision, a new understanding of the world and America's place in it had come. But it didn't emerge. No consensus surfaced from the academics and experts. No voters demanded that their leaders answer tough questions. Instead, three successive administrations re retreated from the global stage, choosing to hide from tough problems and looking for any way possible to pull back. The conversation about US foreign policy devolved into a false choice between occupying the world and hiding from it, with seemingly no middle ground. And no single event marked the beginning of this approach more than when President Barack Obama blinked and backed down before Syrian dictator Assad. It was 2013, and the popular uprising against Assad that my colleagues and I had documented was being met with rising brutal repression. Obama had vowed to act should Assad use chemical weapons on his own people. It was the infamous red line, a warning to Assad and to all dictators that the US would not allow this atrocity to be perpetrated without consequence. The US military was poised for a strike on units of Assad's military forces that had delivered a chemical attack that killed some 1,500 Syrians on the outskirts of Damascus on August 21st. Over 400 of them were children. When he didn't respond with force, diplomatic pressure was left without teeth. American diplomacy was weakened not only in the eyes of its foes, but allies watching, nervousness about the sturdiness of the current world order. As Obama wavered, it was veteran foreign affairs specialist John Kerry, his own Secretary of State, who pointed out the stark reality of the moment best before Obama would hold off on military action. Quote, it matters because a lot of other countries whose policies challenges these international norms are watching. They are watching, Kerry told a press conference. Quote, they wanna see whether the United States and our friends mean what we say. It is directly related to our credibility and whether countries still believe the United States when it says something. 
They're watching to see if Syria can get away with it, because then maybe they too can put the world at greater risk. One person watching was Vladimir Putin. The next year, he snatched Crimea like a thief with few repercussions. The year after that, he went one step further, entering the war in Syria and throwing a lifeline to the Assad regime. With now reasonable confidence that the West would not act against him or any other nation that aided the regime's slaughter, Russian jets bombarded rebellious regions, all but defeating the opposition. This guaranteed continued Russian access to warm water ports on the Mediterranean, and as an additional consequence, protected Hezbollah, Iran's key ally. A Hezbollah official bragged to me in 2017 over tea in Beirut, that their fighters had gained precious experience working alongside Russian special forces on urban fighting and the use of communications equipment. Iranian weapons are now being used by Russia in Ukraine. By February 2022, Putin could not be stopped. His invasion of Ukraine was the fulfillment of a promise he had been making publicly for years, years that coincided with America shrinking backwards from the world, creating a void Putin happily stepped into. Back then, in 2013, even lip service paid to the promotion of human rights around the world seemed impossible now. As Egyptians watched the military's tanks roll over their first ever chance at democratic freedoms, and General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi seized power from the ancient country's first ever democratically elected president, the White House refused to call it a coup. I was there with colleagues when Sisi's soldiers came for the Mohamed Morsi supporters, protesting the overthrow of their democratic rights in the summer of 2013. In my book, I describe the bodies being carried through the streets, the gunfire and panic, as hundreds, likely well over a thousand people, were gunned down by the new dictator's forces in the largest single day killing of protesters since the Tiananmen Square massacre. A decade later, Sisi still runs Egypt, they are still a US ally, and that same military receives over 1.2 billion from the US in military aid per year. The Obama administration, however, did offer an ambitious vision and foreign policy plan in the form of the Iran nuclear deal. Controversial and continually argued over to this day, for Middle East observers on the ground, it offered something new to try to break 35 years of deadlock with the country and prevent nuclear proliferation in the Middle East and begin, however small, to evolve US alliances in the region. Its detractors said it would never work. Its supporters said it would empower moderates in Tehran. We will never know because the single most significant foreign policy action by that administration was swiftly scrapped by President Trump. Indeed, Trump's disastrous romps around the world stage discredited America further, a rapid and wild acceleration for a nation that was already in retreat. Trump's betrayal of the Kurds in Syria, capitulating to Turkey with no strategic gain for America, massively undermined America's credibility globally. His deal with the Taliban was a head scratcher, as though America needed permission from the insurgents to leave the battlefield. It was negotiated not only without Afghan government or civil society representatives, but zero women. The repercussions for that will be felt for generations. In January 2021, as the Trump administration prepared to leave Afghanistan, and those who worked in human rights were subject to a growing assassination campaign by the Taliban, I spoke with Shahrzad Akbar, the young head of Afghanistan's Human Rights Commission. I had known her for several years and interviewed her before but I'd never seen her so heartbroken. Quote, more than anything, I believe all Afghans deserve basic human rights like everybody else on the planet, she told me. I, if people give up on fighting for human rights in Afghanistan, it's in a way saying, you know, many of these people are not ready or they don't deserve it. This is a discourse that really hurts me. It hurts me as an Afghan, it hurts me as a human, that people would think that simply because someone lives in a village in Uruzgan, they don't deserve the he same human rights as someone living in Sweden. Human rights are universal, unquote. 
From his dangerous flirtation with Putin to Trump's pointless photo op with Kim Jong-un and mortifying mugging for the Saudi regime, his foreign policy jaunts were a disastrous tour that left the US embarrassed. But just as importantly, American allies confused and enemies emboldened. America's lack of any real longer-term strategy towards the wider world does continue today at the cost of a stance for the democratic freedoms and human rights it claims to uphold. In the Middle East, this lack of direction has been most evident in the flip-flopping of relationships with Saudi Arabia. Quote, as president, I will remind the world who we are, Biden declared in his first 2019 campaign speech on foreign policy. It focused almost entirely on denouncing Trump and very little on new ideas and plans. Quote, the United States of America does not coddle dictators, he declared. The United States of America gives hate no safe harbor. Three years later, the infamous fist bump with Mohammed bin Salman was broadcast around the world, not least to red-faced American diplomats attempting to make sense of what Biden's foreign policy slogans about global democracy meant. Biden had gone to MBS, as he is known, in an attempt to prevent him from exacerbating oil prices with output cuts. Just three months after that visit, MBS defied the US and OPEC cut oil production again anyway both eventually helping to shore up Vladimir Putin's coffers and humiliating Biden further, his painful fist bump now rendered pointless. Perhaps no recent failure of US foreign affairs has been more devastating than another one I covered personally, the fall of Afghanistan. Biden came into the White House having inherited the Trump administration's deal with the Taliban and a clear May 1st, 2021 deadline by which to make a decision. Afghanistan's more than 30 million people waited to hear what would happen to their country. Biden finally announced just two weeks before the deadline that the US would be withdrawing fully by September, honoring the Trump deal with the Taliban. He offered no details of a plan to get SIV applicants out or what they would do with regards to air support, military aircraft maintenance, or the security of international embassies in Kabul. From that point on, as the Taliban advanced rapidly across the country, taking cities and provinces, he denied that assertions had been made by the CIA that the Afghan government would fall to the Taliban. When journalists pointed out the growing crisis on the ground, White House officials stuck unbendingly to the slogan, Biden is ending the war in Afghanistan, constantly sidestepping questions about how, about what the plan was beyond wheels up. The day before I met those fighters in the Gorband Valley, Biden had snapped at reporters in a press conference in DC, refusing questions. I don't wanna talk about Afghanistan, he shouted. I wanna talk about happy things. Weeks later, Kabul fell to the Taliban. The resulting scenes for 10 days after were some of the most desperate and harrowing I have ever in my 15 years of reporting witnessed. People were trampled to death in the terrified crowds, some of them women. Families were separated. Women were hand, children were handed to US troops in desperation. People who had fought alongside American soldiers, women who had been encouraged to fight for their rights and been told the US would stand with them shoulder to shoulder, wept through razor wire and begged shocked young American Marines for help. Even the Taliban fighters standing and staring at the disarray of the evacuations could hardly believe what was happening. The chaos resulted from an American government that had refused to hear the voices of many experts who had warned them of a sudden, unprepared withdrawal. The killings of US Marines and scores of Afghan civilians in the ISIS bombing of August 26 outside the airport gates was the worst possible outcome of this refusal to plan accordingly. I wrote months earlier about how woefully slow and chaotic the visa process was for American allies in Afghanistan. In the end, it was those people crammed against Kabul airport's walls in August of that year who were slaughtered in the ISIS blast. Many of them had applied for visas, heard nothing, and given up waiting. Six months after the fall of Kabul, Putin invaded Ukraine. The Biden administration's response was, and continues to be, a green shoot in American foreign policy, a robust 
swift response, offering support of every kind short of direct military action, the immediate courage to fight of the Ukrainian people stopped Putin's initial attempt to take over the capital of Kyiv. It was the supply of weapons, intelligence, and training by the US and its NATO partners that has enabled them to keep fighting the Russians and preserve their own national sovereignty, and with it, respect for their border and the free will of all nations. I've talked about these moments at such length because I care about them deeply. I was on the ground living among the effects of US decision making. I saw the real toll felt by civilians as they buried loved ones, dug through the rubble of their destroyed homes, looking for what remained of their lives, dropping to their knees in prayer. In a very real sense, my book, which tells the story of my life as a foreign correspondent, came to be as a result of America's foreign policy mistakes. Yet, I remain hopeful that America's recent stumbles need not foreshadow what is to come. In my career, I have spent time not just in war zones and refugee camps, but interviewing and living among international relations experts and visionaries. Those who do see how the US can play a constructive leadership role in the world. America can and must move beyond the false choice between bombing other nations and ignoring them. The US can engage the world, negotiate peace where needed, act to defend and uphold liberal democracy around the world where it is threatened, and intervene in any way necessary, even at times militarily, where genocide and mass killings are un underway. If America believes in human rights and democratic freedoms, it needs to, alongside its allies, act on those beliefs. And to see what may work in the future, we have much to learn from the recent past. Former Secretary of State and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Madeleine Albright, warned against this aversion to act internationally in 2008. In response to the anger felt by the invasion of Iraq, Albright cautioned against the growing notion of, quote, national sovereignty as an inviolable and overriding principle of global law in an op-ed for the New York Times. Using the Myanmar government's refusal of help after a disastrous cyclone Nargis, she pointed out the dangers when national sovereignty trumps the rights of millions of a country's citizens under the extreme non-interventionist rules of today. Until recently, the post-Cold War, post War world order was one where, quote, the international community would recognize a responsibility to override sovereignty in emergency situations, to prevent ethnic cleansing or genocide, arrest war criminals, restore democracy, or provide disaster relief when national governments were either unable or unwilling to do so. President Clinton's administration encompassed both the moral price of inaction and remarkable achievements in muscular American diplomacy. The failure to act to stop the 1994 genocide in Rwanda haunted his presidency. Quote, we did not act quickly enough after the killing, Clinton said in a speech in Rwanda in 1998. Quote, we, the international community, should not have allowed the refugee camps to become safe havens for the killers. We did not immediately call these crimes by their rightful name, genocide. Indeed, we owe to all the peoples of the world who are, who are at risk because each bloodletting hastens the next as the value of human life is degraded and violence becomes tolerated. The unimaginable becomes more conceivable. We owe to all the people of the world our best efforts to organize ourselves so that we can maximize the chances of preventing these events. And where they cannot be prevented, we can move more quickly to minimize the horror. Never again must we be shy in the face of evidence." Unquote. The Clinton era doctrine of enlargement was slowly formed and unfolded over the years, an American expansion of democratic economic allies across the world. Diplomatic intervention matched with a strengthened and modernized US military became the strategic backbone of foreign affairs successes, like the 1995 Dayton Accords that ended the war in Bosnia and 1996 Good Friday Agreement that brought peace to Northern Ireland. Assistant Secretary of State Richard Holbrook was able to claim victory in Dayton using what he always preferred, diplomacy backed by force. He was, of course, a diplomat and international expert of a different era. 
with a clear idea of the US's role in the world, he worked with a kind of intention and strong policy to build peace around the world and push back the destabilizing forces of tyrants on rampages. Inside the White House, he was no yes man. Albright, in her 2008 column, pointed out other successes of US leadership in the world. The administration of George H.W. Bush intervened to prevent famine in Somalia and to aid Kurds in northern Iraq. The Clinton administration returned an elected leader to power in Haiti. NATO ended the war in Bosnia and stopped Slobodan Milosevic's campaign of terror in Kosovo. The British halted a civil war in Sierra Leone. And the United Nations authorized life-saving missions in East Timor and elsewhere. These were not neo-colonialist adventures and they were not affronts to what some view as cultural sensitivity. They were, argues the former leading diplomat, part of a foreign policy grounded in a moral sense of human rights for all and the responsibility to act on those beliefs. Now, with the growing threat of Putin's expansionist criminal war on Ukraine upending global security and growing tensions with a belligerent China, more than ever, the world needs coherent policy and leadership. The two greatest foreign policy and national security threats require America's place in the world to become front and center. The policies of the Biden administration to provide the military support needed for Ukrainians to defend their own national sovereignty and right to choose their leaders remains the only way forward. It's the only policy that can help Ukraine's people fight the invaders without drawing American troops into battle and a potential NATO-Russian war. The cost of not helping, of effective capitulation, is the passive admission that the rules of the liberal world order do not count. That those who break them by force will not face repercussions from the US. This will weaken NATO, the Western world, and ultimately America. And as I have described to you here tonight, a weaker America on the world stage is bad for the world. It has led to human rights abuses, unspeakable crimes, and the most geopolitically significant invasion of a country in Europe since World War II. The United Nations General Assembly is underway this week in New York. President Biden, in his speech to the representatives of nations from around the world, warned that capitulation or placation of Putin threatened any nation's security. This is essential in the aftermath of a G20 summit where language even mentioning that this war is in fact an illegal invasion of a country was scrubbed away. American leadership on calling this what it is and rallying nations to support Ukraine in any way possible is more important right now than ever. In the same speech, Biden mentioned the need to defend democracy from the abuses of autocracy. It must be pointed out that as he spoke, his administration continues to negotiate a potential defense deal with the Saudi regime of Mohammed bin Salman. This is not the time to speak in one way and act in another. In this moment, if the United States wants to lead the world in defending democratic values, international law, and basic human rights, it needs a robust strategy to do that across the world. It cannot afford to cherry pick at the very moment when enemies of democracy work to undermine American leadership so robustly. I've talked tonight about the past successes of the US on the world stage, not in the abstract. For one of them, I was very much there. This is President Bill Clinton, then First Lady Hillary Clinton, and Senator George Mitchell on the stage in my hometown of Armagh in Northern Ireland. Uh, they share that stage uh, with Northern Irish politics on both sides of a bitterly divided sectarian political conflict. Northern Ireland, September 1998, 25 years ago. I was, about, I was just about to turn 14. And if the camera pans around, you might just see a girls' choir. I'm in that choir. <laughs> I'm just to the right of the conductor, so you, you don't see me in that, uh, in that picture. Um, thanks to the leadership of those like George Mitchell, 
decades of bloody violence that had afflicted my community was brought to a close. The Good Friday Agreement peace was secured in Northern Ireland and the near impossible was proven possible. My life and the lives of everyone in these images and far beyond changed for the better forever. This is the America I remember in the world. And this is the use of global power America must reclaim. Thank you very much. Thank you so, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, this is quite inspiring and robust. <laughs> I apologize for the technical difficulties. Well, not your fault. That's all right. So the way we're going to do this, um, I'm just going to sort of warm things up with a question mm -hmm. or two. And then we'll um, take your questions and we'll pass the mic around. I'll hand off my mic to Jackie Kellish, who's over there. And um, uh, you can just raise your hand and she will get the mic to you. But let me start by asking Jane to talk a bit more about the experience of working in a new genre for you, the memoir mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for this book. And did you encounter particular challenges related, uh, related to the conventions of this type of writing? Or did you find that there was a significant overlap between your journalistic work and the process of crafting a memoir? It was very, very new for me. Um, I have, you know, it, in many ways, the, the, the way that, that one writes a memoir, especially the way I wanted to write it experientially, um, was very much so to write from, from my perspective of any kind of scene that I'm in. I'm, I'm writing it from my own kind of viewpoint. And so I that is antithetical to how we do journalism. Then we would go and interview everybody who was there and we would say, well, you know, and so... Uh, and also, especially at, uh, in the reporting that I've I, I've done in my career, it, it's never self-referential. You know, we're in the story. If there's a if there's a strategic sort of or kind of technical reason to be, we're telling a story of how we went there and we journeyed there. But generally speaking, you know, a, a good correspondent wants a very light footprint. So talking about uh, yourself and certainly talking about your feelings is is not is not a important part of, of the news gathering. So that was a very, very, very new experience for me. Um, it's also lonely work. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to work in TV, even though I love to write, is I wanted to work in teams. I love to travel around the world with a group of great, brilliant, interesting, brave people. And and I love to work with local journalists when I'm, when I'm in country. Um, but writing a memoir is, is a very lonely solo effort, and I I don't think I've ever spent so much time alone just writing like I like I did uh, the summer of 2022. How does that feel? Very intense, mm -hmm. <laughs> very intense, um, and it was it it was strange because although I describe it as lonely, I was also alone with me all day, you know, so, so it, when you write about yourself back then, when you write about yourself in college or in your first job, you slowly start to develop this sort of separation from her. And she becomes this like young person that you're following around all day as you write. Um, so it was lonely, but I was also sort of coming to understand so much about her. Um, so there was a, there was a really profound kind of cathartic experience there too. Is that an experience that you want to continue forward with? Um, I mean, talk to us a little bit about what you're imagining your next project to look like. Well, for me, I, you know, and I allude to this a little bit at the end of the book that, you know, I feel like my, my years on the road doing um, that such an intense uh, amount of field reporting are coming to a close now. Um, I would love to write another book, but I'd like to write something additive. Um, uh, I'm not sure if, if if it would be another memoir, but um, I I really enjoyed the process of writing, you know, and I'm and I'm I'm really really love theater. I'd love again, you know, I, I'd love the idea of of writing something that could come alive, like a play. That would be that would be really really an incredible experience. Um, but journalistically, I'd love to do a little bit more long form um, work. But but the so so, so I've, I've talked to about working in documentary films, but. I think right now there's such a crisis in our industry as the business model just is not working. And now that luckily is also not really the case for public broadcasting, which I, I believe will endure. 
But I'd love to be part of the solution and get kind of get you know, roll my sleeve, sleeves up and get involved in trying to figure out what happens with journalism next because we've got to keep journalists working. You know, however much the organisations and the networks change, what I'd love to to, to see is is um, is being involved in whatever whatever ways we can use tech to help save journalism rather than kill it. Okay, I'm sure there are going to be questions from the audience about your your very bold an expansive vision for U.S. foreign policy. It's almost like a new Truman doctrine that you're, that you're describing, which is, I think, quite wonderful and inspiring. But I, I want to stick with the memoir for just a bit. Sure. Um, so you, you talk in the memoir that you've often, often tried to reassure your friends and family that despite how your work may appear, that you do not take unnecessary risks. So we're all laughing at that. Uh, I think we all recognize that that risk has been present to a greater or lesser degree in, in, in nearly all of your professional pursuits. And I, I'd like to ask you how you assess relative levels of risk when you're in the field and what kinds of topics and issues or imperatives have compelled you to take on the highest levels of risk throughout your career? It's a, it's a great question because... I welcome it because it gives me an opportunity to remind people that most of us doing this work, you know, are not adrenaline junkies. You know, we have a tolerance of risk, not sort of like a a, a love of it. Um, I think that's the healthiest way to describe it. But risk is is a danger is a very subjective word. Um, and so my sister laughs at me when I tell her to stop driving so fast. So, you know, we all have a different perspective. Um, for me, I have I have taken on some extraordinarily dangerous assignments, always because I have measured the um, the the impact that the reporting might have against the risk. Um, there has to be a certain risk to reward, and that is a is a sort of very cold calculation, uh, unfortunately. But one one thing that I have always taken very seriously in my career, and that steered me in that calculation, has been. Are there other reporters there? Um, if somewhere is very dangerous and it's there's reporters everywhere reporting on it, um, I would less likely go there than somewhere where there's a need for journalists. So in my reporting from somewhere like Yemen um, and Somalia, it just felt like, especially for Yemen, because the real costs of that war were, um, were, were were so enormous and so undercovered. That to me was exactly the kind of story where I felt like that was worth taking the risk to do. Um, I was uniquely placed with, with contacts and experience in that country. So it felt like this is an opportunity to actually take this risk and be at peace with it. And And it's also worth pointing out <clears throat> I've often been in a unique position, you know, as a self-employed journalist with, with PBS, um, as most of us overseas are, that I do have a certain degree of autonomy on what I get to do. I get a lot more freedom than many of my colleagues working at other organizations. And that's actually a, a great blessing. But I'm aware that others would like to go, but struggle to persuade their news organizations to let them go. So whenever I went up to rebel-held areas of Yemen, I knew when I came back that, you know, my colleagues at the New York Times and at, and at the BBC were able to turn to their foreign editors and say, see, she came back with 10 fingers and 10 toes and can we go now? And so, so sometimes it's helpful to take a risk if you feel like it's going to open a path of reporting. Um, that, that's, that's one thing that really matters to me. So we'll take some questions from the audience now. I'm going to hand the mic to Jackie and we have one right up front here. So a quick comment before my um, my question. I don't know if you're a citizen, but if you are, could you please run for president? <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a U.S. citizen. I'm uh, Irish okay. and British, a U.S. resident, yeah. married to an American. So. <laughs> so, so on a slightly more serious note. Um, so um, you mentioned about the, in a sense, appeasement of many of these dictators. And last week here, the deputy um, ambassador from the U EU to the U.S. was here and admitted that the EU and the West had been slow to recognize the threat of people like Putin and so forth. And my question is, do you see Biden's attempt to at least engage with them and McCarthy's attempt to get the 
the, um, the right wing part of the Republican Party to go along with things is a, a measure of pragmatism or is it just cowardly appeasement? I think any attempt to 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 try to persuade people, you know, to see uh, the preservation of international law and human rights, um, any attempt to appeal to that is, is really important. If there's a if there is a way to help persuade anybody on on any you know side of the political divide to come over um, and see that this is important, then you know it's worth trying. Uh, Zelensky is actually I'm eagerly awaiting to see what 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 will happen today. Zelensky is visiting the White House today, um, so there's a lot of conversations ongoing. So I mean, those of us who are watching you know for global peace are, are very much so um, going to be watching that to see if there's any way to shift the needle. Um, on that, I think I think broadly most people recognise that uh, that this that this is a, a full scale invasion. Um, most people that I talk to in the United States, I think the fear is just uh, the idea that this could 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 um, you know uh, people say to me all the time that they're afraid that it could snowball and snowball and snowball in terms of U.S. support. So I think making sure, and our job uh, is to make sure that people understand the difference between military aid and military involvement um, and sending troops over there. I think making that distinction is really important. Um, and so, but I mean, I, I, I think, you know, any appeal that could be made to, to rationale on the political spectrum is worth trying to make. <clears throat> I think Zelensky has an incredible talent of speaking to the world anyway and getting around the gatekeepers. <laughs> he has he has a good strategy. Uh, thank you. Um, how are you spared or are you from PTSD? And are there places you won't go? I'm thinking of Haiti. Thank you for asking. Um, PTSD is a very important topic journalists are talking more openly about nowadays um, than they have ever, which is very healthy, especially for young journalists coming up. Uh, I have experienced uh, signs of, of trauma coming out of places. I write about that in the book whenever I come out of, of uh, Syria in 2012. I'm very young. I'm only 27. And I'm kind of macho about how I'm supposed to not be afraid. <laughs> and I come out very afraid. Um, I had a lot of sense knocked into me in Syria, I would say, um, by how afraid I was. So I've, I've experienced it. I've been lucky enough not to have longer term impact. Um, you know, colleagues who have had extreme trauma in the field um, and aid workers uh, have, have often, it sticks with them for a very long time. I've been very lucky to be spared that. You know, I'm glad you asked because it, there is one topic that's just really increasingly getting talked about a little bit more now and, and, and really examined by studies is the topic of moral injury, which is uh, we're finding in studies uh, much more widespread and much more difficult to treat. Uh, PTSD is very apparent and it is very, very uh, 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 traumatic to experience. But it can be treated. We're getting better and better at treating it. Moral injury is a different and complex uh, emotional topic from usually compounded from years and years of watching injustice. Um, I think that's particularly difficult and insipid for journalists because one of the difficulties with our work is not just that we witness things, but we question a lot of the time is our work making a difference? Am I helping people? That can be a very, very difficult moral uh, question to carry with you. You know, I often question myself when I'm in the field in the past, I've said, should I have been a pilot or a doctor or a nurse or, you know, an aid worker, someone who can help the person who is standing in front of me? I believe that journalism helps the world. And I do believe that if journalists weren't present in these places, we'd see a lot more um, arbitrary crimes and a lot more crimes of uh, uh, people committing crimes with impunity. But that's sort of like a big idea, you know, when you're faced with someone who needs help and you don't have a way to really offer that person help, that weighs on journalists, that weighs, has weighed on me over the years again and again and again. And I write about that in my book that um, once I, uh, once Afghanistan um, reaches a real crisis point and Kabul falls, that becomes a, a real crisis for me emotionally. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, to be just an observer. Oh, um, 
<laughs> there's nowhere that, I mean, I would never just blanket ban somewhere. Um, Haiti, I have not gone to, and in part because it's not a part of the world I've covered before, and I don't think Haiti is for beginners of that region. I think it's best left to real experts um, on the crisis there. And there's actually, I actually have a lot of colleagues who have been to Haiti, who went during the, the aftermath of the earthquake and who have gone back many times. So uh, I wouldn't, I haven't pitched to go and it's largely because of the danger matched with my lack of experience there. It's probably not the best use of my skills. I worry more about getting arrested somewhere um, and, and, and held. Uh, that's a big question mark for me. Um, somewhere like Iran, that's really difficult because on the one hand, we want to take, we're happy to take risks with our work, but do we really want to, I don't want to put myself in a position where I end up a diplomatic accident, you know, so, but at the same time, the, the, the protests by women there are so inspiring and so important that we continue to cover them. The Iranian government make it very, very difficult to do that. Um, but that is, that is cause for pause anywhere where I could get picked up and thrown in jail. Thank you very much for a very clear eyed view of the recent past. Uh, and somewhat despairing view. Um, the, uh, I support the U.S. Uh, effort uh, regarding Ukraine, uh, but I'm also worried about the U.S. being, seeing itself as the policeman of the world. Uh, so I, I think there's a need to be very selective in where we intervene. Uh, I think Afghanistan is, uh, I, I was shocked when the government collapsed, when the U.S. left. Uh, the prime minister or president immediately left the country. Okay, we had been there for how many years? 16, 20 years? Uh, and yet, we didn't really know Afghanistan. Uh, so can you comment on how can we be more selective uh, in where we intervene? Thank you for your question. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, Afghanistan, it is, you, know, it, 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 you, you rightly point out that the real kind of shock factor there was uh, Ashraf Ghani fleeing the country. Um, I'll never forget that morning our plane landed at 8 a.m., we I was lucky enough to be on the very last commercial plane from Dubai that was allowed to land. Um, the city looked perfectly normal. By uh, 11 a.m., the Taliban had entered the city, and by 2 p.m., we get news that Ashraf Ghani has fled the country. So this was an unbelievable shock and, and massively impacted events, but you're, you're quite right to point that out. The thing about Afghanistan that is, of course, unique uh, is... It, you know, it in, in the aftermath of 9-11, it's really hard not to see the war in Afghanistan in that light, um, that this was a, a country where Al-Qaeda was based, where it had based itself and planned the 9-11 attacks. So so I think Afghanistan it was unique in, in the way that we view it in, through through history. It's, it's inextricably linked to an actual attack on U.S. soil uh, against U.S. Uh, civilians. So I feel like Afghanistan is often unique in that sense, but a lot of people are concerned about the issue of, of U.S. becoming the, the policeman of the world, which I think I think brings with it, the, the phrase kind of brings with it a sort of insinuation of, of violence in and of itself, you know, that, that they would be uh, policing all behavior all around the world. And I think that most most people, and actually in that in that um, uh, Madeleine Albright piece that I quoted, she also mentions, you know, and also the George Packer piece that 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 the United States can't be everywhere at all the time, and that that uh, human rights abuses are going to to exist. Uh, I personally think what matters uh, as a framework is to make sure that international law is in place, so 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 that the U.S. and its allies within the United Nations and and various uh, uh, organizations around the world can actually try to create at least a certain framework of what human rights are 
and when they are violated to at least be able to highlight what's going on. There are many other ways to place pressure on governments that do um, that, that do uh, contravene any kinds of like G Geneva Convention or any kinds of, of, uh, of human rights around the world. And the United States can help by applying pressure they can apply economic pressure and diplomatic pressure in really robust ways, um, but also really try to bring together warring parties. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the um, abuses happen during conflict. So the ability to end conflicts, the ability to also bring both sides to the negotiating table, is is an incredibly uh, powerful uh, way to impact human rights uh, around the world. Yes. Good evening. Hello. Um, really wonderful. Uh, so these last questions brought out that you've become a subject matter expert. <laughs> did, did you have any intentionality about that as you left home and became who you were becoming early on? Did you go, this is it, I'm going to go to the Middle East, for example. Did you make any deliberate choices? I, I'm really glad you asked that. Yes, I think I did. I, I, I write about it in, in, in the book a fair bit. As a kid, I had a very clear, for, for a child, I had an idea very much so of what I, what I wanted, what I, what I wanted to do. I didn't have a lot of strong female role models who were professionals in my life. Um, it was a pretty patriarchal uh, place that I'd grown up in and uh, but I looked every night on the TV. There were women who were talking and men included, everybody was listening to them and they were telling stories and they were traveling around the world. So I think that's about as intentional as it can get for a seven or an eight-year-old kid, you know, watching and being inspired and then deciding that's incredible. That's what I want to do with my life. Um, I have always been really intentional. Um, I've, I've had not a lot of choice. I kind of write about that in the book. Like I grew up uh, without a huge amount of economic means. Um, I didn't have any connections in the industry. I didn't actually have any idea how I was going to build a career. So uh, I've had to be fueled out of necessity by a lot of blind faith. Um, and so intentionality is a really good word to, to apply. Thank you so much for your remarks and, and your willingness to talk with the group. Quick question about um, your perception of the Wagner Group in Africa and how a country like the United States or how the United States and our allies can be in a position to handle what is going on in places like Africa when um, leaders of countries are engaging with those groups to help control their own populations? It, it's, a, it's a really good question because it's so uh, immediate right now. I think what's happening in with, uh, you know, the, the situation with Wagner is it's hard to separate it with from sort of the wave of coups that we're seeing in that part of the world. Um, I think that you know, this is is a huge concern for for people in the region and for for those who are sort of observers of a part of the world that has actually had in recent years very successful democratic elections. So this is a it's a very rapid reversal. It's it's really concerning to see a reversal that is potentially fueled by and certainly encouraged by uh, Russian business interests. It's important to remember that Wagner Group is a company. It's a it's a corporation. Um, and I think that, you know, any human beings who are being robbed of their human rights in order for others to profit in that way, it's, it's, it's very, very concerning to see it happening so rapidly. U.S. diplomacy in Africa has suffered over the years with sort of a, a, the seeing the State Department being very much so underfunded. Um, there's a massive lack of... of uh, of ambassadors and senior uh, experts, and that's been going on for years. Uh, rapidly, uh, it rapidly um, 
increased in pace under the Trump administration, where there was sort of general cynicism about the State Department and about diplomacy. I think that's probably had an impact uh, on the U.S.'s ability to build those relationships in African nations. But it's also important to remember that Africa has the African Union as well, which is this incredibly you know, robust organization within Africa that is dealing with and responding to, to, to this crisis. Or there's certainly in contact with a lot of coup leaders in, in these Western countries. And it's actually, actually the African Union who I embedded with in Somalia, who, uh, you know, effectively they'll organize themselves as a sort of UN peacekeeping force, but an African Union one, um, where it'll be soldiers from various African countries. And I think that's an incredible resource through which to work for some sort of resolution here. Um, and, uh, and I, I, you know, in terms of in terms of the Wagner group themselves and their future, I mean, we know that, of course, Putin wants to say it's business as usual, we're open for business, coups are very good for business. Um, I think that 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 is a serious threat to security uh, for, for, for people within these African countries. Um, but uh, it it's it's going to be inextricably linked to Putin's future as well, and so I think that that events it just it's just another sign of how events in Ukraine are are going to be impacted by events uh, in are going to impact events in Africa as well. So we'll take one last question from the audience. The gentleman in the back is waving his hand. Oh, <laughs> sure. So you can. There we go. Yeah. Hello. 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 Thank you. I too want to thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation and your critical insights. Um, I think you've touched on this a little bit, but can you talk about non-state actors, um, IGOs, NGOs, uh, human rights organizations, and how they um, they may shape or influence the vision that you have uh, for the international world order today? Thank you. I've I've been lucky enough to work alongside or to to, to even just witness the work of really incredible people internationally who sort of step in a lot of the time I'm working in and visiting or even living in countries whereby even if they're not uh, in, uh, you know, an active war zone or, or, or a civil war, the states often don't provide services that people need. Even in Lebanon, I lived, I lived six years in Beirut and I loved it. But, um, but you know, you, you, you call an ambulance in, in Beirut and it's the Red Cross who come and get you uh, no matter what. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so those who, the NGO world is, is vastly important for picking up the slack effectively where states are not failed states, but they're, they're really failing to provide uh, services to people. I also think that the NGO world is an incredible and, and these days underutilized tool of soft power. You know, um, the Peace Corps uh, w w is is a great example of of engaging in the world and 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 teaching young people to engage in the world as well. Um, but you know, there are there are uh, of course much more dangerous uh, uh, assignments for aid workers like Médecins Sans Frontières, the Doctors Without Borders. We see out there many organizations attached to the United Nations, like the World Food Program, which keeps hundreds of millions of people alive around the world. Um, and so this is, a, this is a really, really important part of, of the global community. Um, and I think that that's also something that, you know, they, they put themselves massively at risk. I think us journalists get a lot of credit, but actually aid workers come under huge amounts of fire as well. And what they do is, is keep people alive. And as I've mentioned again, to, you know, tonight, how us journalists sometimes struggle with, you know, are we helping people? And sometimes that's because we're surrounded by people who are helping others so very well. Um, many of them from that country, just working with non-governmental organizations. I wonder if you might share for the students in the audience a few recommendations, uh, particularly for the aspiring journalists that we have here. Oh, thank you. First of all, don't worry too much about all the conversations about the industry sort of falling apart and it's in crisis. Something, a new, a new platform will emerge. There will people will always want to hear stories and know information and and connect and commune with the wider world. So don't get too intimidated by that. Um, when I graduated college in 2007, I was told newspapers were finished. Radio was a museum item, and and, and 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 journalism was finished. Forget about it. Um, the other thing I would say is don't try to follow the pack too closely. I mean, when I got out 
everybody wanted to rush to Baghdad um, and because everybody wanted to be at the big story. But what matters most is that you're covering something that you're really passionate about. Um, so don't be afraid to follow the stories that really inspire you. Uh, you. You absolutely don't need to be doing other stories that you think, you know, might lead to a bigger career or might be, you know, the stories you see all the other journalists covering. Find something unique that really speaks to you uh, because that's where your best work will be. Um, and so, so that's usually what I would say, like, don't follow the pack. And lastly, what I would say is, and I get asked a lot but for young people ask, um, ask me t for mentorship. And I would say that, you know, there's a lot of pressure really young to excel fast. You know, like we live in an era of top 25 under 25 or top 30 under 30. And I wish I could ban those lists because they, they tell young people that you have to be head and shoulders above the rest or you're falling behind. And that success is actually a kind of overnight thing. Um, and a lot of young people, when they come to me and ask me to be a mentor, what they really are asking for is connections. You know, they want me to make a call and help them get a job. And I get it. I, I, I've always wanted the same when I was younger. But um, if you do get an opportunity to work with a world-class journalist and they agree to mentor you, ask them how you get better at your craft. Have them actually teach you writing, how to be better on camera, you know, how to interview people. Because being really good at what you do is the most undeniable way to be successful. I think a lot of young people are trying to just get that job and just get in the door. But if you just keep working on your craft and getting undeniably brilliant at what you do, excellence is rewarded. And the way there is to find someone who you think is really good at this one particular thing you want to do and have them teach you skills, not just uh, make phone calls and, and open doors for you. Well, let's thank Jane Ferguson for the wonderful work that she's doing. <laughs>